morning, Mr. Daybell. Good morning, Mr. Wood. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Rammel. Good morning, Judge. We're going to go on the record here in Fremont County. It is August the 3rd, 2020. This is case number CR 2220-755. My name is Judge Eddins. This is the case of State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. This is the date and time set for a preliminary hearing. Uh, before we get started here today, uh, the court notes that there have been various precautions that have been taken in order to ensure the safety of COVID-19 issues. Some of those precautions are being six feet away from each other. The court has installed plexiglass up here at the bench. The court notes that uh, Mr. Wood, Mr. Pryor, and Mr. Daybell are not wearing masks. Uh, Mr. Wood, do you want to comment on that issue? I, Your Honor, I can certainly put on the mask. I, uh, it is a little difficult to question and ask, uh, speak with them on, but uh, we will certainly follow the court's directive. Mr. Pryor? Judge, my preference is, is that I be uh, afforded an opportunity to communicate with Mr. Uh, Daybell during these proceedings. Uh, Mr. Wood and I have a significant amount of space between us. I would, I would do whatever the court directs me to do, but at this point, my preference would be to be able to not only question the witnesses, but in addition, be able to speak without uh, any impediment uh, uh, with Mr. Uh, Daybell. If the court directs us otherwise, I will obviously do exactly what the court tells us to do. Mr. Pryor, do you feel that wearing a mask is going to impede your ability to communicate effectively with your client? I believe that if there are questions during the proceedings, Judge, I'm going to have to remove the mask. He'll have to remove the mask, and we'll have to have a discussion. Um, I, I think that at this point, there could be a, some, some difficulties. If we have to communicate through those masks, then I'd rather not do that. It's a personal choice, but I still think it would have an impact on my ability to not only question the witnesses, but to effectively talk with my client during these proceedings. So again, it would be my preference if the, honor, if the judge would uh, honor that request. Mr. Wood, do you feel not wearing a, or wearing a mask is going to impede your ability to effectively communicate with witnesses and effectively question those witnesses? It will certainly make it more difficult here. Uh, the court's going to proceed as follows. I will allow uh, the parties that are not wearing masks currently to continue not to, wearing, to wear masks. However, uh, I will require that the six feet uh, requirement be put into place. Uh, I want everyone to spread away from each other. I recognize Mr. Pryor, you're going to have to communicate with your client and that's going to be closer than six feet. You recognize that there may be a risk there, but uh, that's a risk you're willing to take as well as Mr. Daybell. Is that correct? It is, Judge. All right. Uh, we'll proceed uh, with that then. We'll proceed with the preliminary hearing. Is this matter going to be heard today, Mr. Wood? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Pryor? Yes, it is, Judge. Thank you. Are there any preliminary motions that need to be dealt with before we start the hearing? No, not from the state. Judge, uh, I think we may want to approach briefly on an issue, um, if, if we may. Okay. Would you like to have a, uh, a meeting in chambers briefly? No, just if, we, if Mr. Wood and I could approach the court, uh, it would be a very brief uh, inquiry, and, and uh, Mr. Wood and I have... Uh, Unfortunately, we've been talking all weekend, obviously, about this in preparation for this. And there is one issue that we can briefly take up that'll take not a significant consequence, but will hopefully uh, advance the, the speed of this preliminary hearing. I would like to take the issue up in chambers so there's no issues with uh, recordings and everything else. We'll, uh, we'll take a brief recess back in chambers. We'll reconvene here in just a moment. You spent millions on billboards, commercials, and ads. Tobacco killing more of us than drugs, alcohol, AIDS, or murders together have. I'm angry. I'm angry, and I want people to feel the anger that we feel when we see these menthol cigarettes and other things that are put in our communities and how we need to get rid of them. I felt when you try to put something in a specific community that will harm them, you don't care about them. I have addiction that runs in my family. I've had people that die of lung cancer and things like that. So I know that addiction is something that is not easy to break. But they don't know the harm that they're doing to themselves. And that's what we have to point out with projects like this. Make sure you go to wearenotprofit.org. 
and let your voice be heard. Thank you. Please be seated. 
We're going to go back on the record in CR 2220-755, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Deva. The court took a brief uh, recess so I could have a sidebar with counsel from the defense and the state. We'll proceed forward. Mr. Wood, does the state wish to make an opening argument here today? No, Your Honor, the state will just proceed. Mr. Pryor, does the defense wish to make any opening arguments? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood, you may call your first witness. Thank you. The state calls uh, Ray Hermosillo. Mr. Hermosillo. If you'll please come forward, stand here in front of the witness stand. Raise your right arm and face the clerk. Mr. Hermosillo, you can be seated here at the witness stand. Once you uh, enter that witness stand, because it is surrounded by plexiglass, I'll allow you to remove your mask. We'll uh, get fairly close to that microphone so that we can make a record of you. Mr. Hermosillo, we are making a court record as well. So if you'll make sure to listen to the full question before you begin answering, it will ensure that no two people are talking over each other uh, on the record. Mr. Hermosillo, if you'll give your full name as well as your occupation, we'll get started. Ray Dennis Hermosillo. I'm a detective with the Rexburg Police Department. Thank you. Mr. Wood, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Before I do ask Mr. or Detective Hermosillo any questions, I have several self-authenticating documents and documents that uh, should come into the court under Rule 201. And I uh, will provide those to the court. Uh, States Exhibit 1. I, I'm assuming okay. I hand this to the, the bailiff. Uh, Mr. Pryor, have you seen a, a copy of States Exhibit 1? I have gotten all of the exhibits at this point, but in terms of the numeric, numeric order that they put in, I have seen that, Judge. There's no objection to that. All right. Exhibit 1 will be admitted. Mr. Wood, would you like that to be handed to the witness? Yes. And then, Your Honor, I have uh, several more states. Exhibit 2. Uh, Exhibit 2 will be handed to the bailiff. Mr. Bailiff, if you'll please show that to Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor, any objection to the self-authentication of Exhibit 2 being admitted? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 2 will be admitted. Uh, State's Exhibit 3. Ms. Bailiff, if you'll do the same with Exhibit 3. Mr. Pryor, any objection to Exhibit 3? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 3 will be admitted. Six times. Excuse me, Exhibit 4. The objection to Exhibit 4, Mr. Pryor? No objection, Judge. Exhibit 4 will be admitted. State's Exhibit 5.
No objection, Judge. Exhibit 5 will be admitted. Your Honor, State's Exhibit 1 through 5 are all self-authenticating documents. I have two documents I will ask the court to take judicial notice of. The first is an order on a petition under the Child Protective Act in Madison County Case CV 33-20-45. In the interest of Tylee Ashlyn Ryman and Joshua Jackson Vallow, this order was signed by yourself in that case. Mr. Pryor, any objections to the court taking judicial notice of that document? Judge, if I could have just one moment, may I please? No problem. Mr. Wood, you're not asking for that document to be marked? We will ask for it to be marked and entered as an exhibit as well. Okay, Exhibit 6. Is that correct? Yes. No objection. Exhibit 6 will be admitted. And then, would you like me to just take that into the clerk's possession at this point, Mr. Wood? Yes, that would be fine. The court will do so. And one more document the state would ask the court to take judicial notice of and that we'd ask to be entered in State's Exhibit 7. An order in that same child protection case deeming that Lori Vallow was served on January 25th and that any errors in that service were cured. Mr. Pryor, any objection to Exhibit 7? No objection, Judge. Exhibit 7 will be admitted. The court will take judicial notice of said exhibit. Mr. Wood, any other? No, if I may inquire of the witness now. You may inquire when you're ready. Thank you. Mr. Hermosillo, will you state your name and spell it for the court? Ray Dennis Hermosillo, R-A-Y-D-E-N-N-I-S-H-E-R-M-O-S-I-L-L-O. Thank you. What is your current occupation? I'm a detective with the Rexburg City Police Department. How long have you been a detective? Over a year. Okay. How long have you been with the Rexburg Police Department? 19 years. Are you post-certified? I am. Detective, have you ever had the opportunity to meet the defendant, Chad Daybell? Yes. Is he here in the court today? He is. Can you point him out and describe what he's wearing? Sitting at a defense table in a white shirt, blue tie. Detective, how did you become involved in the investigation regarding J.J. Vallow and Tyler Ryan? In early November, I was contacted by Gilbert Police Department. I was asked to seize a Jeep that was in Lori Vallow's possession. Along with that, I was asked to perform intermittent surveillance. And did you do that for the Gilbert Police Department? I did. Okay. Did they ever ask you to do anything else? Yes. What was that? I was asked to do a welfare check on November 25th, 2019. 2019? Yes, sir. Who were you asked to do a welfare check on? A seven-year-old boy by the name of Joshua Jackson Vallow, who also went by J.J. Okay. And is it all right with you if I just refer to that child as J.J. from here on out? Yes. Okay. Detective, have you ever met J.J. Vallow? No. 
Have you ever met Tylee Ryan? No. Okay. Uh, through your investigation, have you learned what JJ Vallow and Tylee Ryan looked like? I have. Okay. Uh, how have you done that? I've seen hundreds of videos and photographs of Tylee and JJ both. Okay. Uh, Detective, I'd like to ask, I'm going to ask you to look at State's Exhibit 1. Before we uh, get any further into this, let me just remind the media that pursuant to Idaho Court Administrative Rule 32, the court is prohibiting the photography or the filming of any exhibits uh, until further order of the court. That would include, but not be limited to, any documents that are exhibits, any pictures that are exhibits, and any film that are exhibits that are going to be played potentially today. I will allow the cameras to remain running so that the audio can be recorded, but uh, any photography or filming of any of those exhibits is prohibited. Also, any filming or recording of any of the, the table of the defense, uh, any notes or anything else is prohibited, as well as the state. So with that, Mr. Wood, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Detective, do you have State's Exhibit 1? I do. What is that document? This is a birth certificate for Kane and Trahan. For who? Kane and Trahan. Okay. And what is Kane and Trahan's birth date? May 25th, 2012. Okay. And who are Kane and Trahan's parents listed as? Dennis Trahan and Mandy Ledger. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Detective, can you look at State's Exhibit 2? What is that document? An adoption decree. Okay. Uh, who is listed uh, on that adoption decree? Who is the, the child listed on that adoption decree? Kane uh, and Trahan. Kane and Trahan. Uh, who are the adoptive parents of Kane and Trahan? Mr. Wood, I, I'm having a hard time hearing. Are you saying Kamen? Kanan. Kanan, can you have the, uh, the witness spell that name, please? C-A-N-A-A-N. -A -A and the last name? T-R-A-H-A-N. Thank you. Thank you. Who are the adoptive parents of Kane and Trahan? Leland Charles Anthony Vallow and Lori Marine Cox Vallow. Okay. And does that document contain a name change for Kane and Trahan? It does. What is his name changed to? Joshua Jackson Vallow. Okay. Detective, will you look at State's Exhibit 3? What is that document? A birth certificate. Uh, who is it a birth certificate for? Joshua Jackson Vallow. Okay. And what is the birth date listed on that? May 25th, 2012. Thank you. Will you look at State's Exhibit what is that document? A birth certificate. Uh, who is it a birth certificate for? Tylee Ashlyn Ryan. What is her birth date listed? 9-24-2002. And parents listed on that? Joseph Anthony Ryan Jr. and Lori Noreen Cox. Okay. And Detective, will you look at State's Exhibit 5? What is that? A marriage certificate. Uh, who is it a marriage certificate for? Chad Guy Day Lori Marine Ryan Vallow. Okay, and what is the date of marriage? November 5th, 2019. And where was that certificate, uh, that certificate of marriage issued? In Hawaii, on the island of Kauai. Okay, thank you. Uh, Detective, you testified earlier you were asked to do a welfare check, correct? Correct. Um, what did you do in response to that welfare check? On November 26th, 2019, myself and Detective Hope went to 565 Pioneer Road, which was Lori Vallow's residence. Um, we ended up making contact with the defendant, Mr. Daybell, and Alex Cox. And I'm going to stop you there. Who was Alex Cox? 
Alex Cox is Lori's brother. Okay. Um, so you made contact with them. What happened? I made contact with Alex and asked Alex if Lori was home. How did he respond? Judge, I'm going to object here, sir. Mr. Wood, I, Your Honor, this is a statement of a co-conspirator coming in. He is an unavailable witness because he's no longer living, but it's still a statement of a co-conspirator, and I think it comes in. Mr. Pryor, let you respond to that. Judge, I'd like to see the court documents that listen Mr. Alex Cox as a co-conspirator. I don't believe those documents are present. Exhibit at this point, so I, I have nothing that, that supports that other than Mr. Wood's statement. Mr. Wood, Your Honor, the complaint alleges uh, Mr. Daybell, Mrs. Vallow, conspirators known and known, and the probable cause affidavit clearly lists Alex Cox as a co conspirator. Mr. Pryor, it appears that Mr. Wood is uh, explaining that because it is information. Uh, communicated between co-conspirators named in a criminal complaint it falls under uh, the rule of non-hearsay under the Idaho criminal rules. Do you wish, or excuse me, the Idaho rules of evidence? Do you wish to respond to that, Judge? The uh, complaint also lists known and unknown. So at this point, uh, if we go by Mr. Wood's uh, uh, analysis, uh, anybody could be listed or mentioned as a co-conspirator, and all sorts of information can come in. So at this point, I stand by my initial response, which is, uh, at least from my reading of the pleadings and the current criminal charges that are filed, there are two people that are alleged in this thing. And at that point, that's what I believe the proper application of the rule is. Right, the court is going to overrule the objection. Uh, the court finds that uh, Alex Cox is named in the criminal complaint. At this juncture, we're at a preliminary hearing stage where probable cause is the standard. Mr. Pryor, if there are co-conspirators that are named or that are brought up here today, uh, you may renew your objection or you may renew your objection in a further time if you feel that uh, the allegation has not been presented sufficiently enough to show that Mr. Cox is a co-conspirator, but I am going to allow it. Um, under 801, uh, the exception that allows for uh, co-conspirator communication to be admitted. So with that, Mr. Wood, you may continue to inquire. Thank you. Detective, can you answer that question? Can you ask it one more time, please? Yes. Uh, so, well, you had testified you made contact with Mr. Daybell and Mr. Cox. What did you ask Mr. Cox? I asked Mr. Cox if Lori Vallow was home. How did he respond? He stated she was not home. Okay. Uh, what happened after that? I asked Alex if JJ was home. Uh, I informed Mr. Cox why I was there is to do a welfare check on JJ. Uh, so I asked him if he was there. How did he respond? Initially, he didn't respond. Uh, he just looked at the defendant Daybell and didn't answer my question initially. Okay. And then what happened? I asked him again, and he stated that Joshua was with his grandma Kay in Louisiana. Okay. How did you respond to that? I told Mr. Cox that was unlikely because uh, Kay was the one who originally called in the welfare check. All right. Uh, what happened after that? I asked Mr. Cox uh, how I can get a hold of Lori and asked him for her phone number. How did he respond? Uh, he stated he didn't have it. Okay. Uh, what did that make you think when he told you he didn't have his phone number? Judge, I'm going to object. Reason? Judge, this can offer his uh, uh, recitation of the facts, but if we're going to start getting into the issue of whether or not he gets to present his, his impression in terms of what a third party had told him, I think is inappropriate. Mr. Wood, can you repeat the question for the court? Uh, the question was what Mr. What Detective Hermosillo thought of Mr. Cox's response that he did not have Lori Ballow's phone number. Mr. Wood, do you want to respond to the objection made by Mr. Pryor? Uh, Your Honor, I'm not aware of any rule that doesn't allow the detective to uh, describe his his thoughts on an investigation. I'm going to overrule the objection. Uh, Mr. Hermosillo, you can uh, give your thoughts as to what you were feeling at that time. Mr. Pryor, if that goes beyond thoughts, you're welcome to uh, re-up your objection, and I'll re-take it up to Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Wood. Can you answer the question? I thought it was suspicious because I knew that they had been close based on uh, 
uh, my initial investigation. Okay. Uh, what happened? What happened after that, Detective? I asked Mr. Cox where I could find Lori so I can make contact with her, uh, and he stated that she was in apartment 107. Okay. Um, once you learned that information, what did you do? Myself and Detective Dave Hope then went to 107 to attempt to make contact with Lori. Uh, what happened there? Detective Dave Hope went to knock on the front door. Um, as he was knocking on the front door, I saw the defendant Daybell driving towards me in his black Equinox. Okay, and what did you do? I stopped Mr. Daybell to further speak with him. Yeah. Uh, did you ask him any questions? I did. What did you ask him? I asked Mr. Daybell when's the last time he saw JJ, and he stated that he saw JJ in apartment 107 in October. Okay. Now, apartment 107, do you know who, you've stated this was on 565 Pioneer Road, do you know who apartment 107 belonged to or who it lived or who lived in that apartment? Not at that time. Okay. Uh, what happened after, after he gave you that answer? I asked Mr. Daybell for Lori Vallow's phone number and he stated he didn't have it. Okay. Uh, what did you think about it? What did you think of when he told you he didn't have her number? I again found it suspicious because I knew that they were married two weeks prior to my contact with Mr. Daybell. Okay, and, and again, just for clarification, what was the date we're talking about now? What was that date? November 26, 2019. Yeah. Uh, did you ask Mr. Daybell any other questions? I did. I asked Mr. Daybell how he knew Lori Vallow, and he stated that he had only met her a couple times through Alex Cox. Okay. What happened after that? Detective Hope had come back to where we were speaking. Um, I again asked Mr. Daybell if he had Lori's phone number, and at that point, he gave me Lori Vallow's phone number. Okay. Did you ask him why he hadn't given you that number? I did. And what was his response? He stated that he felt like I was accusing him of something. Okay. Uh, in your interaction with him, had you accused him of anything? No. Okay. What did you do in your investigation after that? I called, I broke contact with Mr. Daybell and called Lieutenant Ron Ball uh, to respond to my location. Based on Mr. Daybell's actions, uh, Mr. Cox's actions, what I was told about them hardly knowing each other, I felt there was something more going on with the whereabouts of JJ, so I wanted more officers to figure out what was going on. Okay, uh, and then what happened after that? Lieutenant Ron Ball, Detective Dave Stubbs, uh, and Officer Kellen Wett responded over to 565 Pioneer. Okay, uh, and then what happened? Myself and Lieutenant Ron Ball attempted to make contact with Lori in apartment 175 and were unable to make contact with anybody in apartment 175. Okay, uh, what did you do after that? We went to apartment 174, which was uh, Melanie Boudreaux's apartment. And we stopped right there. Uh, who is Melanie Boudreaux? It's Lori's niece. Okay, uh, and, and then what happened? We were unable to make contact with anybody there as well. Okay, so what did you do after that? I was instructed by Lieutenant Ron Ball to go to the prosecutor's office and obtain a search warrant. Is that what you did? I went to the prosecutor's office, yes. Did you obtain a search warrant that day? No, I did not. Okay. Um, did you have any contact with uh, Lori Vallow that day? I did not have any contact with Lori, no. Okay. Uh, were you still with Detective Hope? I was. Uh, did he, do you know if he had contact with Lori Vallow that day? He did. Okay. Uh, do you know? Judge, could I have some foundation as to? I, uh, I can lay that. All right. You were with Detective Hope that day. Yes. Uh, do you know if he ever attempted to call Lori Vallow with the number you were given? He did. He attempted to call Lori Vallow on the way to the prosecutor's office. Okay. And uh, did he ever get in touch with her? Did he call? Did he? Did she ever answer the phone when he called? No. He was able to leave a message on her voicemail. Okay, and were you with him when he did that? 
Uh, I was not with him when he did that. Judge, I'm okay. to strike. Okay, reason? Well, Judge, he has no basis other than uh, what he was told, obviously, if he wasn't present during that conversation. I'm not sure how he can admit that conversation since he wasn't present for that. And the only way he would know that is if either Lieutenant Ball or someone else told him that that took place. It's hearsay at this point. This is not admissible. Your Honor, we'll just move on. It's fine. All right. That would be stricken. I would do ask that it be stricken from the record. The, uh, that conversation will be stricken from the record. Just so I'm clear, Mr. Pryor, the, the conversation between uh, Mr. Ball and... Your Honor, I believe it was Detective Hope. That Detective I, I apologize. Listed. I said Lieutenant Ball. Uh, Lieutenant Ball? Detective Hope. Detective Ball. I apologize. I meant uh, Officer Hope. Apologize. That conversation will be stricken. Uh, Detective, during your investigation that day, were you able to locate J.J. Vallow? No. Okay. Did you, uh, have you spoken with Detective Ball and Detective Stubbs about their investigation that day? I have. Do you know if parts of their investigation were on body cam? It was. Judge, I'm going to object again, foundation. Mr. Wood. Mr. Pryor, the, the question was if Mr. or Officer Hermosillo knew if it was on body cam. So I, I, I'm going to overrule that objection. That's just a question for Mr. Hermosillo. Obviously, what's, what's in the body cam is probably a different story. You may proceed. Thank you. Mr. Hermosillo, you may, you may answer that question. It was on body cam. Okay. Have you had an opportunity to watch that body cam? Yes. Okay. Uh, I asked you earlier if you were able Judge, to... could we approach, please? You may. Would you like to do that back in chambers? No, no. I'll instruct the media to make sure that uh, recording is not taking place here. We'll go back on the record. Court took a brief sidebar to discuss an evidentiary issue. Mr. Wood, you may ask that question again, please. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, have you watched the body cam video of Detective Stubbs? Yes. Okay. Did you obtain a search warrant on November 26th? On November 26th? Yes. No. Okay. I'm going to call your attention to November 27th, 2019. Um, what did you do in furtherance of your investigation on November 27th? We were able to obtain a search warrant for apartments 175, 174, and 107 at okay. 565 Pioneer. Um, and did you, what was the purpose of searching those apartments? To locate JJ. At this time, were you searching for Tylee Ryan? No. Were you aware of Tylee Ryan at this time? No. Okay. Um, so where did you search? All three apartments. Okay. And 
And just for clarity of the record, those three apartments are 175, 174, and 107 on 565 Pioneer Road? That's correct. Thank you. I will locate JJ in any of those apartments. No, we were not. Okay. Uh, did you find, what evidence, if any, did you find to suggest he had been living there in there, any of those apartments? In 175, there was a half empty prescription bottle of Respiradone and also a suitcase that had JJ's name on it. Okay, and that prescription bottle, did that have JJ's name on it? It did. Okay. Was there anything else of interest to you in searching those apartments? Yes. What was that? The apartments appeared to be lived in. There was food in the refrigerator, food in the pantry, um, furniture. The only thing that was off in 175 was it appeared that there was no clothes. Everything had been taken off the hangers and there was no clothes in the dresser drawers. Okay. Um, did all three apartments appear to be lived in at the moment? Uh, no. Oh. Can you elaborate on that? 107 was completely vacant. Okay. Um, did you obtain another search warrant that day? We did. Uh, what caused you to obtain another search warrant? During the initial search of 175 in the master bedroom, a rental agreement was located uh, for a self-storage unit on Airport Road. All right. Uh, do you know the name of that storage unit? Self-storage. Self-storage. Oh, okay, I apologize. I'm... Uh, do you know the number of the storage unit? I believe it was C-52. Okay. And did you uh, execute that search warrant? We did. What did you find? There were uh, in a couple of boxes, a couple of children's bikes, and in the winter clothing, there was a couple personalized blankets uh, that had the, the pictures, look like family pictures that were sewn onto the blankets. Okay. Detective... What city are those apartments located in? I'm sorry? What city were those apartments located in? Rexburg. Okay. Uh, and what county is Rexburg in? Madison County. Thank you. Detective, uh, at the end of November 27th, had you located JJ Vallow? No, we had not. Okay. What was the next step in your investigation? Well, our next step was we were just trying to locate JJ. Uh, we had obtained search warrants for cell phone data, spoke to numerous uh, friends of the family. Judge, could I get some foundation, please? That's a, that's a very broad statement regarding phone records and, and discussing witnesses with family. I so you're making an objection on foundational purposes, is that correct? It is, Judge. Thank you. All right. Mr. Wood? I'll lay some more foundation, Your Honor. Um, as part of your investigation, did you try to locate uh, individuals who may have known uh, Chad Daybell or Lori Vallow? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, who were some of those individuals? Family and friends. Okay. Uh, do you know any of their names? Uh, Melanie Boudreau, Ian Pulowski, uh, Gilbert Police had contacted family members in Arizona. All right. Uh, did you engage uh, the help of any other law enforcement agencies? We did. We asked for assistance from the FBI. Okay. While you were searching for J.J. Vallow, uh, at any time did Lori Vallow or Chad Daybell, to your knowledge, ever call the Rexburg Police to report missing children? No. In fact, we attempted several times. Lori and her cell phone were shut off. Uh, we attempted to get a hold of Chad and never return, gotten any return phone calls. And in fact, they retained an attorney and refused to answer any questions. Uh, detective, 
during your search for JJ, that investigation ever grow to include Tyree Ryan? It did. Why was that? In speaking with family members, we were also told that nobody Judge, had- I'm gonna object at this point. What grounds? Well, it's hearsay. If he's going to start, or it's not in your head, obviously, if he's gonna start reciting what other people have told him, other than what is permissible under the rules, that's, that's hearsay, Judge, it's not admissible. Mr. Wood, you wish to respond to that objection? Yes, Your, Your Honor, I think it comes in on for the effect of, on the listener to explain what the investigator did. Can you give me the specific exception under Rule 801? Yes. Are you looking at 803, Mr. Wood? Yes, Your Honor. And will you give me which subsection you're looking at? Your Honor, I think it comes in under 8031, the present sense impression explains the, uh, what Detective Hermosillo learned and why he did what he did based on that. Mr. Pryor? Judge, in response, that's not a present sense impression. What it is, is, it, is there's an investigation that's going on and what Mr. Wood is attempting to do is to get statements from witnesses who are not here today. It's clearly hearsay, Judge. His initial response, obviously, in terms of why it comes in, was not appropriate. And this one's just as it's not proper in terms of a present sense impression. Not only hasn't been proper foundation to suggest there's a present sense impression, which he needs to first establish that. Secondly, if this witness would like to talk about actions that he took, I'm not going to tell Mr. Wood how to get any evidence in, but if he would like to talk about any action as a result of talking with other people, he can do that. But clearly, the statements of those other people does not come in. It's hearsay. It's not admissible under any of these exceptions. Mr. Wood, any other response? Yes, Your Honor. Again, it's not coming in for the truth of the matter. It's coming in to establish uh, why Mr. Hermosillo or Detective Hermosillo and his team did what they did. Judge, that's not necessary for you to bring in the statements then. All you have to do is say, officer, and I'm not, again, telling Mr. Wood how to try his case, but quite honestly, Judge, if he suggests to this officer, officer, did you take any action based on what information you received from family members, we can move forward with this thing. But again, objection. It is not permissible or appropriate for him to get in information from those other family members. There is another manner in which he can proceed if he wants to proceed that way. But, but getting those statements in is clearly inadmissible. Mr. Wood, I'm going to sustain the objection as it pertains to uh, specifics to what the family member stated. Uh, those are uh, hearsay. If there are specific statements that you're, you're looking to get in that are not truth of the matter asserted, uh, I'll let you continue and you can try to see what, what can happen. But if you're looking for specific instances or specific statements that have been made by the family members pertaining to the investigation, uh, I'm going to sustain the objection as hearsay. That's fine, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Detective, did you take any steps to learn if Lori Vallow had any other children? We did. Okay, what steps were those? We spoke with family members, we spoke with her son, Colby Ryan. Okay. And did you, in your investigation, uh, did that investigation grow from searching just for JJ to searching for JJ and Tyler Ryan? Yes, it did. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to hand the exhibit or the witness exhibit, State's Exhibit 8. Exhibit 8. Madam Bailiff, if you'll please show Exhibit 8 to Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor. Judge, there's no objection. 
Exhibit 8 will be handed to the witness. Mr. Partner, so I'm clear there's no objection to Exhibit 8 being admitted. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Exhibit 8 will be admitted. Your Honor, I'd also ask that the witness be handed to State's Exhibit 9. Any objection to that admission? No, Judge. Exhibit 9 will be admitted. Detective from Mr. Eight. Are you familiar with that, uh, I, that exhibit? Yes. And what is it? It's a photograph of JJ, Tyler Ryan, and Alex Cox. Okay. Do you know where that photograph came from? I do. Where? It was obtained through a search warrant from Chandler Police Department from one of Lori Bellows' iCloud accounts. Okay, and have you had the opportunity to review the pictures on that iCloud account? Yes, I have. And so you recognize that picture? Yes. Uh, can you tell the court uh, what is in that picture? Uh, it appears they're in West Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park. Okay, um, and who all is in that picture? JJ, Tylee, and Alex Cox. Okay, do you know what date that picture was taken? September 8th. Okay. 2019. Pardon? September 8th, 2019. Thank you. Can you look at, look at stakes a bit? Nine. I do. And have you seen it before? Yes, I have. Uh, do you know where that picture came from? Yes. Can you tell the court? It was also obtained through a search warrant from Chandler Police Department from Lori's iCloud account. Okay. Uh, do you know what date that picture was taken? Uh, September 22nd, 2019. Okay. And is in that picture? It's JJ sitting on a couch. Okay. Uh, Detective, as part of your investigation, uh, did you attempt to uh, locate the... Or let me rephrase that. As part of your investigation, uh, did you look for proof of life of JJ and Tylee? We did. And and what, uh, for his purposes of your investigation, would suffice for proof of life? We had set up a hotline through NICMIC, which is National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, we also had a hotline set up through the FBI, and we would receive hundreds of tips on uh, possible sightings of JJ and Tylee. Okay. And would you follow up on those uh, tips and sightings as part of your investigation? We would. And is it fair to say that a photograph uh, of the child that you could recognize as a child could be considered proof of life? Yes. Okay. Uh, Detective, have you found any photographs of Tylee Ryan after September 8, 2019 that no. you can that you can positively identify as being taken after September 8, 2019? No, we have not. Okay. Uh, in your investigation, have you found any photographs after September 22nd, 2019 of JJ that can be positively identified as JJ? No, we have not. Okay. Detective, have you been able to verify through any tip or lead any other verifiable sighting of Tyree Ryan after September 8, 2019? No. And have you been able to verify through your investigation, uh, or find, I should say, through your investigation, any other verifiable sighting of J.J. Vallow after September 22nd? No. Okay. Uh, Detective, are you aware if a Child Protection Act was filed for J.J. Vallow and, and Tyler Ryan in Madison County, Idaho? Yes, I am. Were you involved in that? I was. How? I was the affiant. Okay. Uh, do you remember when that was filed? Uh, I believe it was January 16th, 20. Okay. And are you familiar with the initial order in that action? Yes. Uh, did that order, let me ask this, did that order pertain to Mr. Daybell? No, it did not. Okay. Who did it pertain to? Lori Vallow. Uh, did that order um, instruct Lori Vallow to, to do anything. It instructed her to bring her 
minor children to the Rexburg Police Department or the, Dis the Department of Health and Welfare within five days of being served. Okay. And are you aware if Lori Valla was ever served with that? She was. Okay. Do you remember what date she was served with that? Uh, January 25th, 2020. Okay. After that was filed, were you ever able to locate Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow? Yes. How did you do that? Through tips and obtaining search warrants for cell phone data. Okay. All right. Where did you believe they were located? In Hawaii on the island of Kauai. Okay. And did you ever have an opportunity there? I did. Okay. Uh, what did you do while you were there? Judge, could I have some foundation, please? Are you can you give some specifics as far as date, time, place? Mr. Wood? When he left, when he came back? You got it. Uh, do you remember when you went to Hawaii? January 24th, 2020. Okay, do you remember when you returned from Hawaii? I, I don't remember the date. Okay. Uh, what island of Hawaii were you on? Or did you travel to? Kauai. Okay. Oh, and again, what was the purpose of you traveling to the island of Kauai? To assist the Kauai Police Department with serving Lori Vallow that uh, order, court order. Okay. And when you say the order, you're referring to that child protection order we just discussed? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you do anything else while you were there? Uh, we also assisted with surveillance. Okay. While you were there, did you ever see J.J. Vallow or Tyler Ryan? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, did you do anything else in furtherance of your investigation while you were there? Yes, I did. What was that? I observed Kauai Police Department execute a search warrant on the defendant Daybell's vehicle and also their residence in Princeville. Okay. Um, did you actually do the search or did you just observe Kauai? No, I just observed. Okay. Um, when you observed them, did you say you observed them search a vehicle? Yes. Do you know what kind of vehicle it was? Uh, it was a, an SUV. Okay. Detective Hermosillo, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. If you don't mind speaking up just a little bit. Okay. I'll scoot closer. Is that better? Yeah. And if you point that microphone up, but aim it at your chin, it'll make a better record. There you go. All right. Um, that vehicle, had you observed Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow in that vehicle? Yes. And when you observed the police, the Kauai Police Department search it, um, were Chad and Lori in the vehicle at the time it was searched? No, not at the time it was searched. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. Uh, had you seen them in it directly before it was searched? Yes. Okay. Um, did you have an opportunity to observe the items that were taken from that vehicle? Some of them. Some of them. Uh, from what you observed, did you observe anything that would indicate that J.J. Vallow and Tyler Ryan had been in that vehicle? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, did you help or did you observe any other search warrants being served? <laughs> yes, on their residence on Queen Emma Drive in Princeville. Okay. Um, did you enter that residence? I did. Uh, did you walk through the whole residence? Not the entire residence. Okay. Uh, what portion of that residence did you walk through? The downstairs bedroom area and uh, the upstairs living room. Okay. Uh, in any of the areas you observed, did you observe anything that would indicate such as, well, did you observe anything that would indicate that J.J. Vallow had been there? No. Did you observe anything that would indicate that Tyler Ryan had been there? No. Okay. Uh, detective, after, after you returned from Kauai, did you ever have a reason to go back to Kauai? I did. And what was that? To also assist the Kauai Police Department with the arrest warrant of Lori Vallow. Okay. Do you know what she was arrested for? Uh, minor or desertion of her minor children, two counts and three misdemeanors. Okay. Judge, can I also have some foundation, date, time, place? Yes. 
Uh, when approximately did you uh, return to? Middle of February. Okay. Um, recall what day you returned from Kauai? Uh, a couple days after she was arrested, which was February 20th, so a couple days after that. Okay. Did you ever have an opportunity to be in court with the defendant Vallow? Yes. Uh, did you observe if she was notified of charges? She was. Were you able to observe if the defendant Chad Daybell was present in the courtroom? Yes, he was. Okay. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you help execute a search warrant on Chad Daybell's residence? Judge, could I have some foundation again? I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but if we could have a date, time, place, and you get some of this in cross in terms of the representation of the last one about the middle of February. I would think that he'd have a more specific time in mind, but uh, if we could have some specifics, I would appreciate it in terms of the date and time. Are you talking about yeah. the, the warrant issue? I'm talking about the warrant issue. All right. The Mr. Wood, it sounds like you just, you, you, you asked the question if uh, if a warrant was done. I'll let Mr. Hermosillo answer that question then as far as the, the foundational issue. I'll sustain that objection. Mr. Wood, you'll need to lay some foundation. Uh, detective, as part of your investigation, uh, on June 9th of 2020, uh, did anything significant happen that day? Yes. Okay. Uh, where did that happen? In Fremont County at Mr. Daybell's residence. Do you know the address? 202 North, 1900 East. Have you observed Mr. Daybell at that residence? Yes. Okay. Uh, what was your purpose of being at that residence? To serve a search warrant of the property. Okay. Uh, and did you, I believe you already said this, but just for clarity of the record, what county is that residence located at? Fremont County. Okay. Uh, Detective, what was the first thing you did in serving that warrant on June 9th? We walked up to the front door to make contact with Mr. Daybell. Um, and what did you do after that? We were able to make contact with Mr. Daybell's son who answered the front door. Uh, he and another son led us into Mr. Daybell's room where he was told that we had a search warrant for the property. Okay, and then what happened? Mr. Daybell came out of the room. Uh, he was able to sit in the kitchen area. Uh, he was allowed to speak with his attorney uh, inside the kitchen area. Okay, uh, what happened after that? Mr. Daybell was told if he wanted to stay on the property, which he could have, he would have to be accompanied by an officer for officer safety reasons. Uh, he was also told he was free to leave the residence if he wanted to. Okay. and. Mr. Daybell left and went and sat in his vehicle, um, which was parked in the driveway facing west off of 1900 East. Okay. All right, Your Honor, the state does have a demonstrative exhibit. We'd like to show the, uh, the, uh, the witness for purposes of clarity for the court and to uh, further help the court understand what the detective is describing. All right. Can you show that demonstrative exhibit to Mr. Pryor, please? Your Honor, may I uh, set up the easel and place you may. Mr. Pryor, an objection? No, Judge. Marcus exhibit. We have not yet your honor. Thank you. 
have a preference on how a demonstrative exhibit is marked? No. Uh, why don't we just mark it as the next number that you've got there? I, I believe the last exhibit that was marked was marked as exhibit nine. This would be exhibit 10. We marked as exhibit 10, Mr. Pryor, just so I'm clear, any objection to the publishing and or the admission of exhibit 10 for demonstrative purposes? I'm sorry, Judge. Just so I'm clear, Mr. Pryor, any objection to the publication and or the uh, admission of exhibit 10 for demonstrative purposes? No, Judge, but what I would like to do is leave that up because I'm probably going to use that across of this officer. So if it, uh, my preference is, is that if... Uh, when Mr. Wood is done, that that remain up so that I can uh, use it in, again as part of my cross examination, if I may, Judge. That's fine. Decide uh, okay. if there's something that happens after this between you and, and cross examination, but we'll make sure that it's available to you at cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wood, you may inquire. Um, uh, before I do, uh, Mr. Pryor, can you do that? I can. Thank you. Within the court and I can. Okay, Detective Kermit CEO, do you recognize that that exhibit, safe to do the 10? Uh, what is it? It's an aerial photograph of Mr. Daybell's property. Okay. Again, what, what county is that in? Fremont County. Now, uh, do you recall Mr. Daybell's address? 202 North, 1900 East. Okay. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you were talking about what happened that morning. He served the warrant on Mr. Daybell. Um, and then I believe you stated that he had gotten in his vehicle. Is that accurate? That's correct. Uh, and can you... Your Honor, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this with the co and plexiglass. Um, so I guess we'll just take it as it goes. If you're going to ask him to, to leave the witness, we'll call it the cubicle. Uh, I will ask Mr. Uh, or Detective Hermosillo to put his mask on when he goes up. There's a laser light over there too, Mr. Wood, if you'd like him to use that. That would be, that would be perfect. Okay. Can you make sure, uh, Detective, that that laser light works? Yep. Okay. And is, can the court and defense do that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, can you point to where you observed Mr. Daybell in his vehicle, like you were describing? Mr. Daybell was in this vehicle here, facing westbound. This is 19. Okay. Um, where were you standing? I was standing right here at Mr. Daybell's driver's door, speaking with him um, just briefly, asking if he needed a coat or anything out of this. Okay. And were you able to clearly view Mr. Daybell? Yes. Okay. Uh, what did you observe when you were watching Mr. Daybell? Mr. Daybell was on the phone. He had the phone in his right hand and was intently continuing looking over his right shoulder. Um, he would look over his right shoulder for a while, break contact on the phone for a second, and then he would look, continue looking back over his right shoulder. Okay. Pretty intently over his right shoulder. Did you have an opportunity to stand at the same location that he had been in that day? Yes. Okay. Uh, for purposes of your investigation, uh, did you attempt to orient yourself towards in the same manner that you viewed Mr. Daybell orient himself? Yes. Okay. When you did that, uh, what did you see? Well, the, the second time Mr. Daybell had got out of the vehicle and went to the back of his vehicle, uh, he was wearing a hat. Um, he stood at the back of his vehicle looking in the same direction he was looking when he was inside. The driver's seat. Uh, he took off his hat, ran his fingers through his hair, looked towards the ground, put his hat back on, went back inside uh, the driver's seat of that vehicle. Okay. 
Now, a detective, I, I don't think you quite understand the question. I, I apologize, must not have been very clear. Um, when you, did you ever stand in that same location that day? I did. I was talking with Mr. Daybell while he was outside of the view. Ever orient yourself in the same lo uh, direction that you viewed Mr. Daybell orient himself? Yes. And when you oriented yourself looking at? The north side, the north side of the property, the pond area. Okay, now when you say the pond area, can you identify that? This, this here is the pond area. Okay. And there's a, there's a tree just to the north, just on the other side of the pond. Okay. Now, Detective, you, you testified earlier you were there to serve a search warrant, correct? Yes. Um, did, uh, were Rexburg police officers serving that warrant? Yes, Rex.